the Story of Life, written by Julie Hickson, adapted by Tim Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> Gotham City is the ultimate comic book city. Aerial tramways loop through the city like sci-fi dreams. Fantastic Langham architecture stretch skyway. Bright blimps slide by. Windows flicker incandescently with light, and traffic squirms through the lacy thoroughfares like a funeral march of fireflies. The city shimmers and steams after a hot day. The shadows are long and blue. The buildings melt into hues of orange, purple, and rose, Easter egg dyed by the last lingering fingers of a gaudy sunset. The room is packed in the Gotham City Courthouse, including the usually empty upper balconies. Overhead, fans are making feeble attempts at penetrating the humid atmosphere. At the front of the room is Thomas Wayne, counsel for the Senate-appointed subcommittee on investigation into racketeering, delivering an impassioned speech to an obviously polarized caucus room. Thomas is in his mid-thirties, and a man of rare sensitivity, strength, and passion, which he masks behind a sardonic throwaway humor. He is a romantic disguised as a realist. Our country's hard-won unions are being increasingly infiltrated by hoodlums and mobsters whose only interest in them is in milking their substantial welfare and pension fund for various illegal activities. Half of the room erupts into wild applause. The other half remains darkly withdrawn. Thomas points dramatically to a lumpish, brooding man sitting behind a table flanked by lawyers, and other legal personnel. It's the king of the mobsters, Rupert Thorne. We have irrefutable proof that this man is using the union solely as an instrument for private profit. Kneeling forward in the crowded front row sits Bruce Wayne, Thomas's ten-year-old son, who is the spitting image of his father. Bruce watches his father with awe. Someone near Bruce whispers something highly complimentary about Thomas's performance. Bruce overhears this and, although unable to grasp its full meaning, it pleasantly underscores his sense of his father's importance. At that moment, Thomas glances up at his son and flashes him a wide smile. Later that day at Thomas Wayne's residence, known as Wayne Manor, Thomas and Bruce have just arrived home from the courthouse. Dashing to the front door, neck and neck, like two kids. They both arrive at the same time. Ty! Actually says, I think it's called a draw. The beloved family butler, Alfred Pennyworth, appears. Looking at Thomas and Bruce with a level of bemused irony available only to someone of his rigorous training and formal background. Although he broadcasts a formidable exterior, Alfred is the glue and heartbeat of the Wayne family. Bruce and Thomas stand up and shake themselves off. In this family, all such displays of camaraderie and affection are completely the norm. Alfred, what's for dinner? I'm starving. Go on into the drawing room, sir. I think it's a bit of a surprise and I wouldn't dare steal the wind of your mother's sails. How did it go today, sir? Well, I think we're nailing Rupert Thorne. And we have enough evidence to implicate a fair number of his cronies, but... I'm very concerned about the possibility of a retribution. Not so much towards me, but towards Bruce and Martha. I'm well aware of the risk, sir. If there's ever anything I can do... I know that, Alfred. Frankly, it's the only thing giving me peace of mind lately. I sometimes wonder if I have the right to expose my family to the risks. Will you promise me something, Alfred? 
anything, sir. If something should happen, promise me you'll take care of Bruce and Martha. My friend, like they were my own. The two men clasp hands in a seal that is both friendship and death pact. From out of the dining room doorway pops Martha Wayne, Thomas's wife, who is in her mid-thirties, intensely feminine and gently beautiful. She is wearing a breathtaking fairy costume, complete with a silvery wreath of leaves woven throughout her auburn hair. Hey, why all the long faces? Am I going to have to eat all this by myself? If you don't hurry up, we'll miss the opera and the ball. Bruce appears, tears past Alfred and Thomas, almost knocking them down, now wearing a spectacular Harley Quinn costume. Nuh-uh, you're gonna have to share some of it with me. We'll be right down, darling. Dinner time. It's a happy event. The meal is indeed a feast. Martha is charmingly telling Bruce and Alfred a story. When your father was running the campaign for the president, they took a train across the country making speeches along the way at various whistle stops. During one speech, a large group of children were making such a racket that the president couldn't even begin his speech. Your father vaulted off the train and shouted, I can beat anyone from here to lamppost, and took off with the whole mob hot on his heels. He beat them too. It's for you, sir. Thank you, Alfred. Excuse me, I'll... You do not threaten me. My family has nothing to do with this. <clears throat> Thomas smashes the phone down, shaking with rage. Alfred stands in the doorway. Thomas turns and looks at him helplessly. Then, Martha and Bruce appear at the door. Hey, Slowpoke. Hurry up and into your costume or we'll leave without you. With effort, Thomas shifts gears, smiles, and glides out the doorway. You asked for it. You better sit down, though. I'm not sure you'll be able to handle it. We'll try. A short time later, Bruce and Martha are waiting restlessly in the library. Dad, come on! As if on cue, Thomas appears bedecked in a majestic bat costume, which itself looks like the showpiece of some magnificent opera. Oh, Thomas, you're splendid! Wow! Sir, you've outdone yourself. Well, after all, it is Die Flatermouse, isn't it? What more appropriate costume than the King of the Bats? I am the chairman of the board, you know. Yeah, Dad, you've told us a million times. What's this opera about again, Dad? Some guy who changes into a bat? Is he like Dracula? You'll just have to wait and see. Quick, before we leave, I just want to do one thing. Mm. And don't groan. Shortly after, Alfred is taking a whole movie of the family with a Super 8 camera. <laughs> Everyone is mugging for the camera, looking particularly absurd in their elaborate Bruce, costumes. <laughs> on the very what last frame, Alfred zooms in on Thomas, who as the self-appointed auteur is waving him in toward the camera for a close-up. <laughs> The Waynes arrive at the Gotham Opera House. They are immediately flanked by the press. Other dignitaries and socialites arrive in spectacular and garish costumes. During the opera, Bruce watches in amazement, captivated by the performance. While two unsavory looking masked characters, who look distinctly out of place, are fixated on Thomas and his family. After the performance, the Waynes exit the building. Yeah, it's a beautiful night. Why don't we walk home? In this getup? Why not? 
Listen, it's midnight. The witching hour. We'll fit right in. Hey, Bruce. You want to humor this guy? Maybe we'd better. I don't want him to fly in the window tonight and suck out all of my blood. Hmm. You have a point there. So, what are we waiting for? Like the true comrades they are, the three link arms and swing off down the street. Their silhouettes become even more charmingly eccentric and somehow vulnerable. A towering Batman, a delicately shimmering Fairy Queen, and a small, whirring Harley Quinn. The streets glisten and gleam, beautifully polished by an evening rain. As they are approaching the corner, the unthinkable happens. An ice cream truck slowly churns the corner and glides by, playing its insipid, tinkling-style music. The truck slows to a near halt, and suddenly the world plunges into a nightmare. For a searing second, Bruce glimpses the face of his parents' murderer, silhouetted in the window of the ice cream truck, while he recognizes it from the opera and the ball. He's about 17 years old, chalk white skin, green hair, blood red lips. It's a face that would make anyone's blood run cold. But for Bruce, it's the veritable embodiment of his nightmare. For a split second, in a look which will reshape Bruce's entire future, their eyes meet, lock, and then, in a blink, the truck careens away to the surreal strains of the truck's music. Thomas and Martha Wayne lay lifeless on the ground in a tangled, bloody heap, their hands still lovingly entwined, even in violent death. Kneeling beside his parents' bodies and pawing at them like an anguished animal, Bruce Wayne cries and cries and cries. The police have arrived. Commissioner Gordon, a large man in his early 40s, and a Wayne family friend of long standing, cradles Bruce in his arms. Tears stream down his face as the bodies are removed, covered eerily in white sheets, making them look like spectral, horizontal ghosts. Bruce struggles to follow, and Gordon gently restrains him in a powerful bear hug. Alfred arrives, leaping out of a cab, gray and drawn, his hair uncharacteristically awry. He sees the bodies being moved into an ambulance. Blood has already stained the white sheets. Dear God in heaven, what have they done? He rushes to Bruce, who flies into his arms like a terrified baby bird. I just want you to know that as long as I live, you will never be alone. Together, the faithful butler and the orphaned boy weep uncontrollably amidst the chaotic aftermath of ultimate violence. Dignitaries from all over the world come to pay their respects at the Wayne's funeral. The attendant priest finishes his eulogy with a quote which penetrates the fog of Bruce's pain and main lines into his inner core. Thomas Wayne was that rare phenomenon. A man whose power, not as an end in itself, but as a means of redeeming the powerless. I'd like to finish this service with a quote from Emerson, which was a favorite of Thomas's, and I think best describes him. Great men, great nations, have not been boasters and buffoons but perceivers of the terror of life and have manned themselves to face it.
Bruce is standing alone by his parents' grave, looking haunted and withdrawn. I knew at that moment that my childhood had ended. I knew I would never again know peace. Standing over my parents' graves, I made a silent vow. I would avenge their murders. I would forgo love, family, friendship, all the trappings of normal living to dedicate my life to a relentless war against crime. Bruce begins his fanatical period of training. He masters every fighting style possible. He learns advanced hypnosis, fencing, skydiving, swimming, meditation, archery. He learns to use varying forms of weaponry with amazing proficiency and skill. He masters all the major languages. He becomes adept at gymnastics acrobatics, accomplished at chess, delves deeply into the sciences of criminology, law, medicine, astronomy, physics, and even dabbles with magic and witchcraft. Throughout these formative years, he compulsively combs through the newspapers daily for any information about Gotham crime and specifically Rupert Thorne, devouring it with a vengeance. His office and his basement hideaway are covered with elaborately maintained flowcharts following Rupert's whereabouts, his associates, and minutely cataloging the events of his career. Bruce also has an evolving relationship with Commissioner Gordon, who regards the boy as a second son and gives him much advice, guidance, and affection as the boy will allow. Often, however, their friendly dinners erupt into heated arguments over Bruce's obsession with Rupert Thorne. It is Bruce's contention that Rupert is the man who ordered his parents' death. Since there were several other crime lords involved in the conspiracy against his father, however, Bruce has never been able to positively pinpoint the man who gave the order. Gordon beseeches Bruce to let go of it and to get on with his own life, cautioning that his preoccupation with Thorne is unhealthy and poisoning his other relationships. Alfred is also concerned about Bruce's obsessiveness, but always approaches Bruce with gentleness, quietly feeding him, nudging him into bed when he's fallen asleep at some near impossible task in exhaustion, combing his hair thrusting a bag of lunch into his hands as he rushes out for an, another class, putting him to bed at night, and comforting him when the nightmares come. As Bruce's abilities and interests grow, the caliber of equipment in his basement hideaway escalates in scope and sophistication to eventually include an elaborate gym and trapeze set, highly evolved criminology and science labs, state-of-the-art computers, processor and tracking systems, all embellished with Bruce's massive trophy collection and precursors of what will become the Bat Cave. Only Alfred knows of the existence of the basement, which is accessible through a secret panel hidden behind a fake bookcase in the mansion's library. Each night before he goes to sleep, Bruce lies in his darkened bedroom and ritualistically watches the shaky home movie taken the night of his parents' death. Each night, his last impression before oblivion is his father in a bat costume, bookended by his mother and his younger self, gesturing in what was intended as silly gag, but which, in the boy's haunted mind, has taken on new proportions, beckoning him into some imagined reunion in the silent hereafter of the screen. Years have passed, and Bruce, now a heartbreakingly handsome young man in his downtown office, holds a newspaper 
with the headline, Joker escapes prison, vows revenge against Mayor Rupert Thorne. Commissioner Gordon promises immediate action. Mr. Wayne, Commissioner Gordon is on the phone. Bruce, have you seen the headlines? Yep. <sighs> Listen, Bruce. Don't do anything stupid, okay? Don't worry, Commissioner. I'll leave the Joker to the proper authorities. Good. I just hope something can be done about that rampant corruption that's been sanctioned under Thorne's administration. That day, the Joker begins a carefully masterminded reign of terror in Gotham City that starts with a whimper, but builds to a bang. He releases all the animals from the Gotham Zoo, creating panic in the streets, especially when a lion gamely gets on a loaded bus at one stop and casually gets off at another. He takes over various television shows, ridiculing guest stars, interrupting love scenes, inventing the news, forecasting fake weather, disrupting and infiltrating the airwaves. He has all the windows of Gotham's towering skyscrapers painted black so no one can see out. And he makes all the subways go backwards. And for an hour of primetime television, all shows are blocked out and replaced with this Joker-esque message. All work and no play makes the Joker a dull boy. <laughs> that evening, Bruce is playing chess with Alfred. The television is on in the background, broadcasting the Joker's inflammatory propaganda. At 10 o'clock, the love boat suddenly appears, suggesting that, for the time being at least, we've returned to normal programming. Except when we get to the guest stars, the Joker materializes and gleefully promises a continual campaign of chaos. Later that night, Bruce restlessly paces in the basement. His turmoil and inner tension is palpable. For the first time in many years, he watches the time-worn home movie. Again, he comes to the familiar moment, his father wearing the bat costume, silently beckoning to him. In mid-gesture, the film breaks, creating a prophetic impression. Once again, it's as if his father is inviting him into some longed-for secret world. Suddenly, the film flies out of the projector and rolls across the floor. Decisively, Bruce crosses the room and opens a drawer. He takes out a box. He removes layers of tissue, then a cowled headpiece, gloves, boots, a black bat insignia on a yellow field, decorating the chest. Almost in a trance, Bruce begins to undress. A short time later, Batman, dressed in full costume, studies himself in a full-length mirror. Great men, great nations have not been boasters and buffoons, but perceivers of the terrors of life and have manned themselves to face it. The Prince of Darkness is born. Batman prowls the city, using his specially designed suction gloves and knee pads, which enable him to scale walls and buildings. It's Christmas time. He glides through the twinkling city as close to experiencing joy as he's been since childhood. Christmas decorations sparkle gaily. Arriving at Gotham Square, Batman encounters a curious spectacle. The Joker, surrounded by shocked onlookers, as he's laughing insanely, and then inexplicably launches the beautifully decorated 100-foot tall Christmas tree into the night like a rocket. I've been in prison, and I haven't had a Christmas in the last 15 years. I hate to be a Grinch, but I am eradicating Christmas from Gotham City. <laughs> Much
much to the Joker's pleasure, Batman arrives, challenging him, and they have their first confrontation. A violent ballet of a fight which rages through the square, across the ice skating rink, and eventually surfaces on the rooftop of the Gotham City News Building in front of their gargantuan trademark clock. The fight ends when the Joker violently pushes Batman off the roof, who somersaults 20 stories and only narrowly misses death by landing gracefully in a protruding awning. When Batman looks up, the Joker is gone. All of this is witnessed from below by hundreds of breathless spectators and stunned police, creating a flurry of speculation in the next morning's news media. What and who is Batman? Is he another flamboyant criminal or a crime fighter? Is he here to vanquish the Joker or is he an ally? Over breakfast, Alfred places the morning paper beside Bruce's plate and gives him a knowing look. Bruce reads Rupert Thorne's unctuous promises to capture the Joker with disgust. He makes the bitter observation that Rupert's only motivation for capturing the Joker is in saving his own skin. Bruce then receives another call from Commissioner Gordon. Bruce, tell me. Do you know anything about this Batman character? Uh, no. Bruce, I shouldn't have to remind you that you should not, and better not, take the law into your own hands. Completely understand, Commissioner. Good. As the days pass, the rampant mayhem perpetrated by the Joker increases drastically, achieving total panic throughout the city. His pranks careen from the simply whimsical, by painting the entire city wildly candy-striped, to the downright dangerous. With the expertise of a master politician, he coerces various union leaders, inducing them to order strikes, so that the city is virtually immobilized without water, power, gasoline, subways, food, and so on. Indiscriminately, he has bombs set off at various locations throughout the city, always accompanied by a pathological joke message relating to the specific location. In what by now has become a nightly ritual, he takes over television, often dressed in some flashy costume, to merrily announce some new scheme with maniacal delight. Each night, Bruce dons his bat costume and scours the city all the while finding his sea legs as the masked crime fighter. Single-handedly, he foils a jewel heist, a violent mugging in the Gotham City Park, and interrupts a gangland murder taking place at Gotham City Pier. Prowling like a cat, he searches feverishly for the Joker's lair. By day, he inhabits his charmingly sardonic Bruce Wayne persona, which includes being one of Gotham's primary businessmen and philanthropists, a calling which often throws him into charity and city functions attended by Rupert Thorne. Obviously, there is no love lost between these two. Bruce has yet to ascertain if Rupert is responsible for his parents' death. The next evening, Bruce is preparing for just such an event with obvious apprehension. It's a gala charity benefit scheduled to take place at the Gotham City's Opera House. It's the first time he's attended an opera since his parents' death. He's nervous. At the Gotham City Opera House, it's Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream, and is introducing the dazzling new singer, Silver Saint Cloud, in the role of Titania, the Fairy Queen. Despite the obvious psychological underpinnings, Bruce is intrigued. With Wagnerian theatricality, the Joker crashes the opera, penetrating the kind of mayhem that every kid bored out of his mind at the opera would dream about, magnified to epic proportions. 
The finale is a riotous fireworks display so violent that people flee in terror, and many are injured. Bruce finds Silver and leads her to safety backstage. The Joker departs flashily in his Joker mobile, spraying a myriad of colored smoke bombs and distinctly unfunny machine gun fire. Bruce escorts Silver home. After years of psychic and physical abstinence, he has an instant connection with Silver, and the feeling is mutual. Meanwhile, the Joker retreats to his headquarters, which is located in the penthouse of a towering industrial building, brandishing a large sign which says, Novelties, all your needs for every occasion, parties, jokes, and magic. Inside his penthouse, an impromptu TV station has been set up in a corner, featuring a red carpeted spiral staircase lifted straight out of Gone with the Wind. Bizarre experiments in varying stages of development fill different rooms. Against one wall is an enormous fish tank filled with Joker fish, which are normal fish that have been exposed to his recently refined grimacing gas which gives them wildly grimacing mouths. The Joker reclines at his desk in a gigantic chair, most closely resembling a throne. A true megalomaniac, the Joker has obviously elected himself the king of his bizarre world. In a conversation with one of his scientists, an ex-cellmate nuclear physicist from his prison days, it is ascertained that the grimacing gas is a deadly nerve gas, which can be fatal if administered in large enough doses. When one of the fish dies convulsively and sinks to the bottom of the tank, the Joker laughs gleefully, <laughs> executing a mad dance while rambling insanely. <laughs> I will destroy Rupert Thorne, and I will destroy Batman, and I will achieve total anarchy in Gotham. <laughs> Later, in a frightening conference with his ghoulish accomplices, the Joker elaborates his plan to stage a mock election, nominate himself as mayor of Gotham City, and to celebrate with a victory parade comprised of giant parade floats. The clincher is that one float will be filled with enough grimacing gas to wipe out the entire population of Gotham City. Only subscribers to the Joker's cause will be spared death. Meanwhile, Bruce leaves Silver's apartment and heads back to Wayne Manor. For the first time, he enters the now fully appointed Batcave via a secret entrance, a nearby barn located several hundred yards from the mansion, which has been connected to the Batcave by an underground tunnel. Once inside, Bruce parks next to his recently perfected masterpiece, the Batmobile. As always, Alfred is waiting for him with food and quiet comfort. Master Bruce, I have some rather unsettling news. During the night, the Joker took over the comedy club, and after delivering an insane monologue of Billy Crystal jokes to his terrified and captive audience, he released a lethal dose of gas, killing everyone in violent spasms of laughter. Also, Commissioner Gordon called. He wants to directly enlist Batman's aid in their fight against the Joker. He wants to know if you can get a message to Batman of that effect. What shall I tell him? Tell him I'll try. The outcome is a lifelong collaboration between Batman and the police, by way of Commissioner Gordon, and the creation of the Bat Signal as a means of contact between them. In an attempt to maintain some semblance of normalcy in the city, Bruce and Silver decide to attend the yearly benefit for the Gotham City Crippled Children's Fund, which, in an effort to maintain security, is heavily guarded by Gotham police. 
The event is an elaborately orchestrated circus housed by the Newton Sports Arena, which is in a suburb of Gotham. Despite all their precautions, however, the circus has been infiltrated by the Joker, a fact which becomes uncomfortably obvious when while scanning the performers, three familiar characters are seen. The Penguin, Natalie dressed as the circus ringmaster. The Riddler, artfully disguised as a clown. And Catwoman, sensually decked out as a trapeze artist and dangling gracefully in the rafters on a trapeze. After the exquisite fanfare and preliminary acts, the main attraction of the evening is introduced. The Flying Graysons, the world's most renowned hire wire act, comprised of John and Mary Grayson and their 10-year-old son, Dick. Their act is particularly dangerous because they work without a safety net. After executing a spectacular series of serial somersaults, the family leaps in the tandem from their high pedestal, aiming for a waiting trapeze. Horribly, the ropes break due to shrewdly applied acid by Catwoman, and the three tumble through space, accompanied by horrified screams from the audience. Miraculously, young Dick's lighter weight causes him to veer into a nearby pole, deflecting his fall into a stack of hay piles along the sidelines, like a baby bird falling out of a tree into a nest. His parents, however, fall to their deaths. Bruce is jolted to his feet, as if by an electric shock. Immediately, the Joker appears high above the audience, screaming like a Harley Quinn banshee and claims credit for the foul deed. In the attendant chaos, he and his minions affect their escape in a smoke screen of fire and confetti bombs. Accompanied only by the throbbing of his own heartbeat and nearly blinded by the nauseating waves of deja vu, Bruce makes his way to Dick, who is sobbing beside the angled bodies of his parents. Wordlessly, he scoops the boy into his arms and carries him through the crowd to his car with a pale face silver by his side. Once in the car and hugging the shaking boy to his chest, Bruce says as much to himself as to the frightened boy. Hey, I just want you to know that as long as I live, you will never be alone. Weeks have passed, and Bruce has begun legal proceedings to adopt Dick Grayson as his ward. Dick is a charmer, a clever little wise Alec with a loving heart. He's pale skin to the point of ghostly, defined by an alert little face and carrot-colored hair. Although still gracelessly puppyish, he moves with an elegance and agility acquired through the years of intense acrobatic training. Dick becomes less haunted and gradually integrates into Wayne family life. Alfred and Silver can even see the positive effect this change has on Bruce. Some age-old coldness in him is being thawed by his love for the boy. They are healing each other. In a much-hyped media event, the Joker, dressed up for the occasion as the Mad Hatter, is interviewed on television by Barbara Walters, who is obviously tied up and being held at gunpoint. To her credit, given the insane circumstances, she keeps her cool and conducts the circus-like proceedings professionally. Between narcissistic preening and lunatic ravings, the Joker announces his intention to run for mayor of Gotham City against Rupert Thorne. His platform maintains the logic of a madman. Vote for me, and I'll end the citywide rampage of terror and mayhem, for which I am responsible. 
It's a political catch-22. <laughs> in the ensuing days, the Joker makes good on his threats and steps up his terrorist tactics, reducing the city to a carnival-like war zone. This is Alan Scott with WXYZ Radio in Gotham City. In a move that shocked the already dramatized city, the Joker staged a mandatory debate between the city's mayoral candidates, himself, and Rupert Thorne. The entire program was broadcasted citywide and mediated by Wally George, whose level of psychosis somewhat rivaled the Joker. It was an exhibitionist dream come true, and the Joker rose to the occasion, magnificently turning in a performance that was both seductive and surprisingly logical. Rupert Thorne was terrified. As a joke-laced tirade at Thorne's expense, the Joker played his final hand. Without a hint of warning, he pulled out a gun and repeatedly shot Thorne in the chest. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, however, the police arrived too late, and the Joker escaped. That evening, the Wayne household is bustling with activity as calls are traded between Batman, Bruce Wayne, and Commissioner Gordon, an insightful look into the schizophrenic nature of Bruce's life. In time, they begin to hatch a plan. To add to the drama, Bruce is competently fielding Dick's pleas to accompany him on his mission. Finally, after relentless youthful pressure, Bruce simply refuses. Dick, you're too young, and you're too ill-prepared for the rigors of crime fighting. Dick is reasonably unconvinced. The next day, to his delight, the Joker receives a surprising challenge via a giant billboard unveiled over Gotham's Times Square. Bruce Wayne for mayor. A vote for Bruce is a vote for Gotham City. En route through Gotham to his hastily devised headquarters, Bruce surveys his city with disbelief. It looks like a scene from Pinocchio's Pleasure Island sequence. Stores and buildings are bombed, abandoned and boarded up with hastily scrawled closed signs in every door and window. The streets are pockmarked from explosives and violently splashed with day-glow swirls of color. The city is literally wallpapered with the Joker's psychedelically threatened campaign posters. Vote for Joker or the joke's on you. Passing a newsstand, Bruce notices that literally every magazine features a different Joker portrait, including the Joker as Time's Man of the Year. The streets are filled with Joker converts. On alternating street corners, Bruce notices an alarming number of hastily erected Joker booths, manned by propagandists spouting Joker fans who are aggressively passing out Joker masks to all their enlistees. The masks are unusually elaborate in design, arousing Bruce's suspicions. Slowing his car to a snail's pace and adopting an appropriately goony attitude, Bruce picks up one of the masks. Once inspected, it corroborates his darkest suspicion. Although they are gaily painted in bullseye colors, they are actually gas masks. Turning down a wide boulevard, Bruce encounters an awesome sight. Thousands of people line the sidewalks facing the street, which is being fanatically monitored by the recently appointed Joker police who are dressed in candy-striped clown clothes, sporting a squirting flower in their lapels. At least half of the spectators are wearing Joker masks, giving them a blatantly otherworldly insect-like appearance. With typical Joker-esque humor, 
the election eve has been disguised to coincide with Christmas Eve. And to celebrate both events, the Joker has promised a dazzling parade. Due to the clues we've gotten along the way, we know that this parade has another deadly purpose. Bruce surveys the giant helium-filled floats crafted in various shapes and sizes. As he cruises by the floats, he scrutinizes them thoughtfully, and he gets it. Oh my gosh, that's it. When Bruce arrives at his headquarters, he receives a congratulatory joke bouquet of squirting flowers and a box of exploding cigars from guess who? Grimly, he places a call to Commissioner Gordon. Commissioner, I believe that the Joker has filled at least one of the parade floats with his deadly grimacing gas. If he releases that gas during the parade, anyone not wearing a Joker gas mask will die. It's a lunatic's insurance for winning the election. Exactly. Bruce hurries to a small, well-guarded television studio and delivers a fiery speech. Citizens of Gotham, I challenge you to resist the Joker's revolutionary tactics and cast your votes against him. Then, Bruce dashes into an empty storeroom where he changes into Batman. As Batman glides over the rooftops, he passes various election polls where people are voting. In a typical Joker-esque bad joke, the polls are barbershop striped and designated north for the Joker and south for Bruce Wayne. Camouflaged in various disguises, Commissioner Gordon and the police quietly infiltrate the parade. Meanwhile, at his headquarters, the Joker is handed the polling statistics by a statistician. The polls indicate a Bruce Wayne sweep. The Joker goes berserk, screaming with fury. The Joker demolishes his headquarters in an infantile tantrum. Calmed by the sight of his deadly fish tank, he collects himself and exits. In the streets of Gotham, it's pandemonium. The Joker smiles with perverse pleasure when he sees the streets filled with glaring caricatures of himself. As he approaches the section of the street harboring the waiting parade floats, a digital message flashes across the top of the Gotham Times building. Bruce Wayne wins the election in a landslide victory. Merry Christmas. The people alternatively react with both confusion or exuberance. The Joker seems unfazed and hastens down the parade-filled street, passing float after float, and then stops, pointedly at a darling 10-story high teddy bear float, tethered to the ground by trailing ropes, anchored by bodyguards. From out of the shadows emanates a familiar voice. A chalk face. It's Batman. Standing on top of the Batmobile, cape streaming out behind him. Well, well, well. Cute outfit. Didn't I see you in a production of La Cajou Fola? <laughs> Feel like picking on somebody your own size? Now are we speaking physically or mentally? With lightning reflexes, the Joker produces a gun and takes aim at Batman, who counters with a flick of the wrist, sending a batarang flying violently knocking the gun out of the Joker's hand. The Joker scrambles after the gun and runs, shouting a command to his guards, who ominously start closing in on Batman. Using all of the skill acquired in his years of training, Batman fights the men off as a whole, the result of which is that they let loose of the ropes on the teddy bear float containing the deadly gas and releasing it into a gradual upward motion. Oh, you fools, that's the gas. Cornered by Batman, the desperate Joker shoots the unfortunate group tethering a nearby clown float and hitches a ride on a trailing rope just as the float becomes airborne. Thinking fast, Batman leaps up and follows suit, 
Dangling below the float on their different ropes, Batman and the Joker rise serenely above Gotham City and glide through the night. The Joker alternatively shoots at Batman, who avoids his bullets by swinging back and forth on his rope, like some sort of gothic Tarzan, and at the gas-filled teddy bear float, which jauntily bobs past them on its peaceful journey up into the sky. Thankfully, he misses, and soon the float is beyond shooting range, sailing out into the hemisphere. As they glide over the rooftops, Batman looks below and realizes they are directly approaching the roof of the Gotham City Natural History Museum. Thinking fast, he rips a plastic grenade from his utility belt, lobs it at the float, and drops to the museum roof now directly below. A split second later, the grenade explodes, ripping a hole in the side of the clown float, sending it and its Harley Quinn passenger spinning wildly through the air on a helium joyride. Narrowly missing the museum roof, Batman crashes instead through a huge skylight and falls to the floor in a dazzling shower of broken glass. Dazed from the fall, he lies for a moment in the eerie silence of the museum. Suddenly, with an ear-splitting crash, the careening clown float with the Joker attached explodes through a huge window and sails to the floor, landing squarely on the still groggy Batman. Screaming with hysterical glee, the Joker leaps at Batman in a frenzy, and with the undulterated strength of a madman, pins him to the ground and points the gun at his temple. Just when it looks as if all is lost, a faint ripple of wind shudders through the museum, a hiss of a breeze accompanied by the dull sensation of tiny fluttering, as if heralding the entrance of a small bird. A high piping laugh pierces the darkness, <laughs> commanding the Joker's attention. Perched atop the gigantic arcing frame of a gleaming dinosaur skeleton, a flash of red and green, a devilish mask. It's Robin, who we all know as Dick Grayson. Heard any good jokes lately? Batman seizes the moment and karate chops the gun out of the Joker's hand. The Joker rolls away, planting a vicious kick on a dinosaur foreleg as he does so. The result is another childhood dream. The giant bones collapse in a domino effect skeleton dance. Finding himself sitting on air, Robin executes a spectacular swan dive from his high perch, landing squarely on his feet. He proudly flashes a grin at Batman. Fancy meeting you here. I didn't think you were the museum type. In one beautifully synchronized moment, the fighting duo leaps into action, flashing after the disappearing form of the Joker. I'm going in alone. Find a phone and call the commissioner. You know the code. But... Hey, I'm serious, Dick. <sighs> okay. Robin sprints down the hall. Batman enters the room. Unbeknownst to the Joker, his infrared vision pinpoints him immediately. From Batman's point of view, he sees streaming red waves of heat and electrical currents outlined in a Joker shape. It's like an incarnation of the devil. Batman pounces. The Joker aims the gun and manages to get one shot off before Batman hits him, full force, and wrestles the gun away from him. Gripped by monumental rage, Batman smashes the Joker to the ground and puts the gun to his head. Before I destroy you, tell me, who ordered you to kill Thomas and Martha Wayne? <laughs> 
kill them! Who killed them? Who killed them? Who killed them? The joke's on you, Bruce. I beat you to it. It was Rupert Thorne. I killed the man that killed your parents. But you can't kill me. You can't. See, that would make you just like them. <laughs> there is an unbearable moment of tension as Batman wrestles with his darkest self. The gun poised, shaking at the Joker's temple. Robin watches from the doorway, not breathing. From out of the darkness, a large paw of a hand claps on Batman's shoulder. You've done your job, man. It's over now. Let us have it. The tension in Batman's body slowly relaxes. The spell is broken. Batman drags himself off the Joker and hands the gun to Gordon. The Joker is handcuffed, read his rights, and led away by a squadron of guards. Oh, and uh, by the way, Batman, I'll keep our little secret. It's more fun that way. I don't have many playmates who can give me a run for my money. And as the saying goes, with friends like you... <laughs> Batman glares at the Joker with hatred. I, I have to get out of here. Batman turns to Robin, who half smiles his understanding. Together, the incredible duo stride away through the ruin of the museum. Gotham City thanks you. Batman and Robin half turn, acknowledge him with a brief wave, and continue out of the building and into the night. Free from demons. Finally, home. The next morning, it's Christmas Day. Bruce, Dick, Alfred, and Silver are sitting around a magical Christmas tree in the Wayne Manor living room, laughing gaily and opening a mountain of presents. Happiness fills the air. <laughs> Finally, when they've waded through all the presents, Alfred passes out silver cups of Christmas punch for a celebrating toast. Giggling charmingly, Silver notices one last present nestled under the tree. Oh, look! There's one more! Bruce, who is closest to the tree, reaches down to retrieve it. Bright purple and green striped. A toy jack-in-the-box nestled in the bow. Tim from Newverse Creative, and I want to thank you for listening to this audio adaptation of Batman, written by Julie Hickson. 
If you enjoyed this script and you want to hear more about it, I definitely recommend that you check out Superhero Stuff You Should Know. You can find them on YouTube and anywhere that you listen to podcasts. So definitely go check them out and listen to their episode that covers this same script. And make sure to like, subscribe, comment, and all of that good stuff. 